cause this process some strong restrictions or some, uh, you need some strong control. What software is actually control, uh, installed in your car? I won't talk about that now. We will come back later to that in the security part. And so on, there's a long list. One interesting application could be instant messaging. So if the car in front of you is driving too slow, in your opinion, you don't need to use hand signs and wave friendly, but you can send him a message directly and so on. But um, you might have noticed today most of these applications are warning and assistance mechanisms. In theory, it will also be a potential for automatic reaction and driving. So for example, you could do this highway lane merging completely automatically. But for some very good reasons and not necessarily technical reasons, uh, manufacturers and also researchers currently restrain from that. Because when you do automatic driving, you get a whole bunch of problems like user acceptance. Will users accept that their cars drive on their own? Uh, there are a lot of legal issues. What happens in case of accidents? Who is responsible, the driver or the computer? And also insurances uh, will need to rethink their insurance models. There's a quite nice video. No. That shows that insurances are actually aware at least of these procedures. Was wäre, wenn die Autos von morgen eine völlig neue Versicherung brauchen? Weil wir heute schon an morgen denken, können Sie jetzt und auch in Zukunft auf unsere individuellen Versicherungslösungen zählen. Zürich, because change happens. Now, when I, when I first saw this video, I thought, hey, that's cool, and you need a lot of technology to do that. Actually, I was wrong. We probably don't need the technology for that, because I've, I found another video. Uh, it's an intersection somewhere in India. And, well, I, I don't think they have all regular communication equipment on their bikes and cars, so it seemed to be possible also somehow else. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Audio communication. But it seems we, we don't need all this technology. But, but I have some doubts that actually Germans would be able to participate in here. Could be a problem. <laughs> okay, so there are some local congestions. They need some more enhanced flow control, but I think it works pretty well. Would be interesting to, to see some statistics, how many accidents actually happen there. I guess so. <laughs> okay, so for, as I said, for some reasons, um, all these applications will stay within the warning domain. Automatic driving might be an issue in perhaps 20 years or so, but probably not earlier. Um, as I said, there are a lot of stakeholders in this area and there's a lot of interest and also a lot of research and a lot of research money invested in that area since a couple of years. Um, it's all, that's also one of the reasons why it's interesting to work in that area because uh, I, I worked on ad hoc networks in a generic way before that and there you're completely within your research domain and you make some assumptions and here you really have to deal with, with the real world out, out there. there are, uh, standardization bodies, there is the question of frequency regulation, what frequency bands do you use. Uh, there are a lot of European research projects, also a lot of national research projects, past and present, that have uh, 
delivered some, some first preliminary results in these issues. I will present most of, or some of it during my, the rest of my talk. There's also already a manufacturer consortium, the car-to-car -car communication consortium. It's not related to the Carl's Computer Club. Um, but anyway, they, they are actually about to define standards, at least that's their mission, to define standards for vehicular communications. So the goal is probably to really have products with this technology in a time frame of five, seven, eight years. Because otherwise it wouldn't be, it would be useless to make standards already. Let's see what, what will happen. I, I assume it will probably take a little longer until you really see it. There are then a lot of stakeholders that tell you, no, you cannot use that, and you cannot use it. all too expensive, and we won't build it into our cars. Also interesting. And also, as I, as I motivated, uh, legislation plays a role. What, what happens if your car emits false warnings, and this leads to other accidents? A lot of interesting questions, not only for technologists. And actually, car communication, there, there have been early approaches already in something 60s, 70s, when you, when you have a look at the cars. Um, but actually, they weren't too successful, as you might imagine. Uh, so it was only about in the, in the late 90s that uh, when the wireless uh, communication technologies has matured enough that people started to, to really research and look at this vehicular communication. So it's a relatively new field. And in this field you find a whole bunch of different technologies. It's not only about communication from vehicle to vehicle, which is envisioned to be done by some flavor of 802.11, but you actually have a lot of other technologies involved. So you have roadside units that communicate by different means with the cars. This could be also uh, radio, but this could also be infrared or something else. Um, you plan, or one plan is to, to equip road signs with communication capacities, message signs, but also to, to include all these other communi long range communication technologies you see here. Or Hotspots, for example, when you when you are at the petrol station, long-range broadcast technologies for information dissemination, like map updates in your navigation system, and of course, you also need localization mechanisms so that the cars know their exact, precise location. So you also have satellite navigation, which plays a role, and so on. So it's a whole bunch of technologies that's involved here. I want to pick out some. Uh, specific communication or some specific technologies that are especially important for this car to car communication on the data link layer as i already said there should be a fl or there is there are currently plans to develop a flavor of 802.11 802.11p which is a modification of 802.11a so it works in 5 gigahertz band and um, this should cover the the data link layer and to get uh, better coverage, you also want to use multi-hop routing like in ad hoc networks or in mesh networks, and I will talk about these two technologies next. So when you go into this area, you see a couple of terms. Um, one common term in the U.S. is DSRC, dedicated short-range communication, which both specifies the principle of communicating in short range by wireless land between cars, but also uh, means a specific uh, spectrum uh, set aside specifically for vehicular communication. So the US already took a leap and they reserved these 75 megahertz. In Europe, there are still ongoing discussions about that, but in the US, this is already available for usage by exclusively by vehicles. Um, there's another sta set of standards uh, subsumed under the tail uh, un under the acronym WAVE, Wireless Access in Vehicular Environments. Uh, this is a set of standards covering different uh, layers. Uh, it includes 802.11p, but also addresses other issues. 
And this 802.11p is, as I said, a modification of 802.11a, which can be used for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle or vehicle-to-infrastructure communication. Um, one problem is that they haven't, that they modified, at, they try to modify 802.11a as few as possible so they can keep chip design and everything to, to build these uh, devices uh, cheaply. And as everybody who, all, who ever watched into the area of ad hoc networking um, and multi-hop ad hoc networking knows, uh, the, especially the medium access, uh, the MAC of 802.11 in general is, is not very well suited for this multi-hop communication. So there, yeah, this 802.11p really um, gets this uh, bad I would call it bad medium access uh, mechanisms, but anyway, and this is one of these real world constraints where the people, where the manufacturers say it should be cheap. It can only be cheap if the chips are mass products, and mass products means stick with existing technologies. Um, what actually, yes. You, you probably won't be able to do this because it operates on distinct uh, frequencies. So you would need some kind of software radio that you can tune to arbitrary frequencies. I'm not sure if, if uh, current chipsets allow that. Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm, the, the question is, uh, was if one could use existing wireless LAN technology to, to interfere, interfere with these regular communications. I'm not completely sure about that. Uh, I mean, as I said, we, we have distinct frequencies, and I'm not sure if you can use the, the ordinary wireless LAN equipment and uh, shift it to that frequencies. You probably need some, some software radio or so for that. Some information on that? Um, basically, the problem is that, the, as you said, uh, the Mac, um, which is uh, for some cards implemented in software, like for Atheros, um, is not very well suited for um, mesh uh, network or mm -hmm. ad hoc. Um, so um, one solution would be to rewrite this uh, hardware abstraction layer and uh, to um, maybe um, for, uh, change this, this uh, P standard into a fork or something that is uh, much more suited to uh, ad hoc uh, mesh. That would be but it's possible with, with current hardware that you can buy. Yeah, sure. I mean, you, yeah. You, you can replace the Mac, but then it wouldn't be conforming to the standard, and there are no plans actually to, to change that for the standard. They try to modify the standard as few as possible, so I don't see this happening. Anyway, so what, what you have, you have uh, seven distinct channels, uh, 10 megahertz each, and you can also combine two channels to, to get enhanced bandwidth. Uh, so you get up to 54 megabit uh, per second like you do it with 802.11a. Um, the, the interesting thing is that these channels have been uh, separated for different purposes. So the central channel is this control channel where most of the communication, most of these warning messages, also beaconing messages and so on, will uh, be transmitted on. But uh, using some still to be defined reservation protocol, you can use the control channel to set or to reserve these other channels for more bandwidth uh, expansive communication. So for one, one idea would be if you um, for, for some reason need to, to download a file or whatever, you can try to, to reserve some spectrum here. Uh, the idea is that the control channel is only used for short packages uh, or for short packets so that you don't block it for a longer time because uh, another important thing here is with all these warning messages, we have a very time critical applications. You cannot wait um, 
couple of seconds until you send the warning messages because then the accident might already have happened. So that's also interesting here. But as I said, uh, some details are still missing. The current plans are to, to have this standard finished uh, 